Council, I'm, I'm sure I'm re misreading the graphs. Uh, on I'm looking at 247, 248. Didn't half the borrowers say they would not have any trouble paying their loans without regard to the forgiveness program? So it varies based on income bracket. And yes, it's true that, that in certain income brackets, the data I think reflected that, you know, 51% of borrowers expected that they would be unable to pay their student loans. That wasn't the only, sec the only data the secretary consulted, though. In those same studies that he referenced, there was uh, general data about levels of financial insecurity. And overwhelming majorities of borrowers expressed huge financial insecurity concerns about their ability to make ends meet going 10 years into the future. Now, I think one of the important things to recognize, again, as I had mentioned in the last argument, is that it's not necessary for the secretary to make a finding that each and every borrower who really receives relief under this plan would have necessarily gone into default or delinquency without it. No, of course not. But I mean, it does kind of uh, factor into the consideration, particularly in a situation where you don't have notice and comment uh, of proceedings. Uh, that maybe, uh, th again, that's something that a broader um, uh, representation of national interests in Congress would take into account rather than what the, uh, uh, the secretary in a particular case, who's weighing a lot of options and considerations as well, would take into account. I mean, if more than half the people say they don't need this relief, extending relief to that breadth uh, certainly raises questions. So let me be clear that I think there is an avenue to address those kinds of questions with overbreadth. I, I don't think that it's a function of statutory interpretation, though. That would be applications of the statute to particular fact patterns and whether the secretary could justify the lines he drew and the level of relief he decided was necessary. And here, Secret Car Secretary Cardona explained that huge numbers of borrowers were going to go into default and delinquency, and it's not as though he could easily segregate and say, here are the 50 percent where I know for sure it will happen, and here are the 50 percent where it won't. If, if he could make that kind of determination, it might provide a basis to determine that he should have drawn different lines. But we don't have anything like that here. And I would just point again to the forbearance policy. You know, that has applied across the board to every single student loan borrower with a federally held loan for the past three years. Um, but I think that both secretaries acted entirely within the domain of the HEROES Act in recognizing that that kind of broad class-wide relief was necessary due to the particular exigencies of this emergency. Thank you. Um, since we're dealing uh, in, a, in a case with individual borrowers or would-be borrowers, I, I think it uh, appropriate to consider uh, some of the fairness arguments. Uh, you know, you have a, two situations. Both two kids come out of high school. They can't afford college. One takes a loan. Uh, and the other says, well, I'm going to, you know, try my hand at setting up a lawn care service, um, uh, and he takes out a bank loan uh, for that. Uh, at the end of four years, we know statistically that the uh, person with the college degree is going to do significantly financially better over the course of uh, life than the person without. Um, and then along comes the government and tells that person, uh, you don't have to pay your loan. Uh, nobody's telling the uh, person who is trying to set up the lawn service business that he doesn't have to pay his loan. He still does, uh, even though uh, his tax dollars are going to support the forgiveness of the loan uh, for the, uh, the college graduate, who's now going to make a lot more than him uh, over the course of his lifetime. Now, it seems to me you may have views on fairness of that, and they don't count. I may have views on the fairness of that, and mine don't count. We'd like to usually leave situations of that sort when you're talking about spending the government's money, which is the taxpayer's money, to uh, the people in charge of the money, which is Congress. Now, why isn't that a factor that should enter into our consideration under the major questions doctrine again, where we look at things a little more strictly than we might otherwise when we're talking about statutory grants of authority to make sure that this is something that Congress would have contemplated? So. My reaction to that, Mr. Chief Justice, is that Congress did take those kinds of considerations into account in specifically providing this authority to the Secretary. I think that the same kinds of arguments well, about Well, it's just fairness, circular. You're, 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 it sort of you know, begs the question to say that, for, uh, first, I don't see any evidence that they took 
the, the, the person who's trying to start the lawn service because he can't afford college. I don't see any evidence that they took him into account. Um, but if that's what Congress would need to take into account and show, then it can't legislate. It can't provide the executive with preauthorization to take action into an emergency. Congress can't look ahead to the future and say, okay, in the year 2020, when an unprecedented global pandemic hits, we've decided that the lawn care professional should you know not benefit from this program, but the student. So you're, you're relying on, the, on you're relying on an interpretation of the statutory authority uh, to say that that's implementing Congress's intent to do that in a pandemic that they couldn't have foreseen. We do think no, they would have foreseen the idea when they said uh, a modify or waive that that would mean waiving the whole liability for 40 million Americans at a cost of half a trillion dollars, that they, foreseen, they foresaw that enough to allow the secretary to act without any express congressional authority, any more express congressional authority than the authority you rely on. Well, let me break it apart into two different components, because I think there's a first order question of whether Congress could have foreseen the possibility of debt discharge at all. And I think the answer to that has to be yes. That was a well-established form of relief that you can provide to borrowers in, in hardship situations, as I previously mentioned. It's one of the core provisions in the Title IV, uh, and Congress, in specifically enacting a statute that's aimed at this problem of not leaving borrowers worse off in reaction to a national emergency, clearly understood that using the so broad just going language... That, uh, well, so that's I'm the not, first I'm not, question. I recognize... I'm not, I'm not faulting yeah. you for repeating your answer, <laughs> since I think I probably repeated my question. But you're just saying you know, it's the same argument about what modify and waive means. It is as a statutory matter on the categorical argument about debt discharge. Now, you have asked me several questions about the scope of this program, and, and let me try to be responsive to that. I recognize that this is a big program, but that's in direct reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic, which itself was a really big problem. There hasn't been a national emergency like this in the time that the HEROES Act has been on the books that's affected this many borrowers. And so I think it's not surprising to see, in response to this once-in-a-century pandemic, the kind of relief that the secretaries have offered here, the forbearance policy that has itself cost $150 billion and now this loan forgiveness program. To the extent that you have concerns about the scope and size of the program, though, I would say that if I can get you to agree with me, and maybe I can't, on this point that the categorical debt discharge argument doesn't work as a statutory matter, then I think the right place to look to house those concerns is an arbitrary and capricious review. We think here that the secretary drew reasonable lines in crafting the scope of relief, but if you disagree or if you think he should have taken different interests into account, that would be a basis to reverse him on arbitrary and capricious grounds, not to distort the plain meaning of the HEROES Act. Thank you.